Samuel chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. And the men of Kirjoth Jerem came and brought up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in, Kil- in Kirjar Jerem, Jath Jerem, Lord help us, that the time was long, for it was 20 years. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's a long time. And all of the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve Him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And then the children of Israel did put away, say put away, Say it again, put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel into Mispeth, and I will pray unto the Lord. I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together in Mispeth and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day. And said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel and Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, cease not. To cry unto the Lord our God for us. That that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord of Israel. Unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard him. And Samuel was. And as Samuel. Excuse me. Was offering up. The burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomforted them. And they were smitten before Israel. And when the men of Israel went out of Mizpeth and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to Beth Car. And Samuel took a stone and set it between Mispeth and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Here there too hath the Lord helped us. And the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Let us pray this evening. God, we come before you. We thank you for your word and its power and its anointing. We thank you that your word is alive. And Lord, that it still speaks in many ways to us and ministers to our hearts and lives. And Lord, I ask that our ears would be open, that we would hear. Our hearts be open, that we would receive what your word has to say to us tonight. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. And the church says, Amen. I know... A little long in reading tonight, but I wanted you to get the whole story. I believe this is an accurate description of where the church in America has been for the last little while. We've seen that through COVID-19 and the shutdown, I've talked to many young people, I've talked to some elders alike that have said, I never realized how much junk was in my life. And the children of Israel, through the prophet Samuel, began to realize that they were missing something. 
We see here in verse 2 of this chapter that the the presence of God hadn't dwelled in the land of Israel for 20 years. Again, turn to your neighbor and say, that's a long time. That's a long time. You see, and we in the modern day church, we've had visitations of His presence. We've had comings and goings of His presence. But it's been a long time since the, Amer- since the people of America could look at the church and say, the presence of God dwells there. It's been a long time since we've walked into the house of God and you could just sense His presence as soon as you walk through the door. It's been a long time since the presence of God dwelled so much in the American church that that I remember growing up that they would pull in off the side of the road and say there was just something about this place and the Lord drawed me and I just pulled in here and, and I just feel the presence of God in this place. It's been a long time since the presence of God has dwelled with the people of God. Again, we've had visitations. We'll sense His presence on a Sunday and it seems so far away on a Monday. But listen, I want to tell you in in this time that we're in that God wants to dwell again with His people. That God wants to move in great and mighty ways as He once did before and even do greater So there's this big absence we see in our text of the presence of God dwelling with the the people of God. And it says they began to mourn and cry and hunger and thirst, if you will, for the presence of God. And I believe through all this COVID-19 and all this distraction and all this stuff going on that it's actually given us time to realize we've been missing something for so long. And it's allowed many, and I believe the the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, not the church world, but the true church, as pastor would say, the remnant of true believers, it's allowed us to refocus and realize we have idols in our life. There's things that we put before God in our life, that we put this and that before God in our life. And now we're starting to realize that we've been running through life from visitation to visitation. We've been running through our lives with a little goosebumps on this Sunday and and it'll give me enough charge to make it through another two or three Sundays and and then maybe I'll, I'll feel God's presence again. Listen, we can't go on that way in the American church because it's we're just to be frank, we're dying. We've been dying for a long time, but the remnant of believers, the true church in this country, I believe, have realized through all of this that, listen, we miss the presence of God. I miss hearing the stories of of what my grandmother would tell me about the the tent revivals and the services. And and now we have a younger generation of parents and, and even young adults and now teenagers that's saying, I want what they talk about. I want to see blind eyes open. I want to see people get up out of wheelchairs. I want the presence of God. And we're in a time where the people of God have begun to to mourn and begin to seek and to begin to hunger and thirst after the presence of God. And then as we go through this story, you see there is men and women of God, Samuel being that representation, that are declaring, okay, if you want the presence of God, we have to repent. We have to repent. As pastor preached Sunday, repentance is not optional. We have to repent. God have mercy on us. And he said, listen, if you want the presence of God to dwell again with you, you've got to leave some things behind. I've mentioned this before and I've told our young people this countless times. As the, the country begins to open up, what are you going to open yourself up to? Everything's been closed. You haven't been able to go nowhere, do anything. But when everything opens up, what are you going to run to? Repentance means to turn away from. To pursue Christ. And listen, there was no option. Samuel said, you need to do this wholeheartedly with everything that you have in you. And you have to serve God only. Only worship him, only seek after him, only pursue him, only, only. 
There's no other choice. And we see that really through all of this, and I promise I'm getting somewhere through all of this, there have been many people that have repented and, and have realized, hey, listen, through, through COVID and all this, I realize that my life has been really crowded and messed up and, and I'm turning away from that and, and I want what God wants for my life. And there's young people saying, listen, I want what, what God has called me to do. I want to run after my purpose. And there's this, this turning around and, and really you even find that in, in verse 6 that, that Samuel calls the people together. And there's even been, Pastor, almost like a unity throughout the body of Christ. You'll talk to ministers and they're all thinking the same thing, believing God for the same thing, believe God wants to do something in the day and hour that we're living in. And there's people all across this nation that want the presence of God just as bad as this ministry does. There's been this coming together. But what I want to bring out to you tonight is that the enemy's not going to just let it happen. You think the enemy isn't going to resist revival? You think the enemy's not is just going to roll over and say, you know what? You're right, you can have it. The enemy does not want unity and does not want repentance because those two things are a breeding ground for revival. He doesn't want unity and he doesn't want repentance because that's a place where the Holy Ghost can begin to bring renewal to someone's life. That's a place where, that, that's a good foundation for revival to be built on. And in that turnaround, you better believe there's going to be trouble in the turn. There's going to be trouble in the turn. And we find that they come to, to the prophet, the man of God, in verse 7. And they say to him, listen, listen, we, 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 we know that they're coming for us. The Philistines are coming for us. The adversary is coming for us. And the Bible says in verse 7 that they were afraid. And listen, I don't, I don't know if you've watched the news at all the last few weeks. But the unity that the church had, the direction that the, the remnant of, of God had, is starting to dismantle right in front of us. We, we turn on the TV and it's division, division, division. It's hatred, hatred, hatred. You have church leader pointing at other church leader. And, and you have politicians on, on TV saying they, they have all the answers. There's trouble in the turnaround right now. I believe this church and many churches like us really want what God wants for this house. I believe there's churches a lot like this ministry throughout this country that say, listen, we can't stop where we are. We've got to go further. We've got to go deeper. We have to see more. We have to reach more people. We have to see the miraculous. But there's been trouble in the turn. And Brother Steve, I've talked to believers on the phone the last few weeks. Man, I'm kind of afraid. We don't know where this country's going to go. We don't know what we're going to do. But listen, you need to see past the lies of the enemy. And realize that we're still in a season that God wants to do something wonderful and powerful through you. And through His church. That God is still wanting His people to rise up. And to be that glorious bride that He's always wanted. We're in a time where, where the world's going to grow darker. But we'll never shine brighter. We're coming to a time where the enemy may come. But you better believe that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's trouble. There's trouble in the turn. Listen. 
there's been a cry in the last few weeks from church members across the country and the lost like in verse 8 of this chapter there's been a cry to the men and women of God saying can you intercede for us do you have answers for us can you get a hold of God on our behalf and listen I'm going to be very frank with you. The world's asking for answers and asking and really desiring for God to do something. They want to believe, but they have not seen. They want to believe what the church is talking about. They do. They want to believe that there's a God that still heals and delivers. But they're not seeing it. They're not seeing it. And and again, being frank with you, I've seen ministers. And and listen, I I love the men of God and and, and all the... the, I love them. I, I do. There's just no other way to get around it. But I've seen them bicker back and forth. Everybody's come out and been in front of the camera and said, I, well, I, I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to talk about that and I'm going to talk about... And there's a world out there saying, no! We want to see something. We've heard the talk. We want to see the walk. We've heard you preach about it, but we want to see it happen. We've heard you talk about love, mercy, and grace. We've heard you talk about deliverance. We've heard you talk about salvation. We've heard you talk about divine healing. We've heard you talk about the ministry and the call and the purpose of God on each and every person's life. We want to see it. But we spent so much time. Men and women of God have spent so much time feeling the pressure of this world to respond to everything. Over the past few weeks, I've seen men and women of God receive overwhelming pressure to respond to the situations in this nation. I've seen many women, men and women of God bend over backwards trying to respond to meet the people's needs. I've seen men and women of God tweet, like, and post trying to respond to every comment that's being made. Listen, and their motives are right. I'm not questioning their motives. They, they, they want to see healing. I believe that. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. But they want to they respond to everything. But let's look at the text. That's not what Samuel did. That's not what Samuel did. Where's the true prophet? Where's the true men and women of God? When they came to him and they said, Samuel, the enemy's coming. Chris, he didn't acknowledge what they said at all. He didn't say any. It didn't say that Samuel said back to them. They said, hey, listen, the enemy's coming. Division's coming. All hell's breaking loose, Samuel. He didn't say a word. He didn't. He didn't say anything. To the men and women that came to him and said, we need answers. We need deliverance. He didn't do any of that. And we have a culture that feels like we need to respond to everything. We're connected through social media. And oh man, if I got retweet, I got to tweet back. And and if I got tagged in this, I got to do this. And if I get one bad comment, I got to make a video, a seven minute video, talking and explaining myself. And, And listen, we feel like we have to respond to everything. But that's not what the man of God did. He said, man, I ain't got nothing to say. I got nothing to say. And you say, well, that's silence. You know, the world doesn't need silence. No. What the man of God was saying, I I have nothing. It's not in me. I can't deliver anybody. I can't bring unity to anything. I can't deliver anyone. I can't heal anybody. He said, listen, I'm going to go up to an altar. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to seek God's face. Why? Not so I can tell you some prophetic word, but so I can show you the power of God. 
I'm sick and tired of feeling like we in our personal lives and, and in the ministry especially that we have to respond to every current event. We don't have to. We need to do what Samuel did. In verse 9 it says he grabbed the lamb. He pleaded before the Lord. Went to the altar pleaded before the Lord. And he said and the Lord heard him. You say what? That's not profound. No it's not profound. But Samuel wasn't at the altar. Praying to God. Well, someone tweeted me. I better respond. Okay, I'm back. And he's praying. Well, someone put a negative post on my video on YouTube. Okay. I got to make another YouTube video to explain the explanation of the explanation. To explain to you that's not what I was saying. Okay, now I'll go back to the altar. That's not what Samuel did. That's not what Samuel did. He said, listen, you can say what you want to. The enemy can get as close as they want to. But I'm not leaving the altar. And that's where my title comes in tonight. He says, I'm going to remain at the altar. I'm going to remain on my knees. I'm going to remain in the presence of God. I'm going to stay in his presence. I want to hear what he has to say. I want to see what he wants to do. I want his words, not mine. I don't want, listen, we've had a culture in the last few weeks of filled with nothing but enticing words of men's wisdom. Oh, well, we promise you this and, and we'll get this passed and we'll get this passed and we'll get that passed. Listen, that's enticing words of men's wisdom. What we need is a church that will stand up as Paul said and won't use enticing words as men's wisdom but he said they will come in demonstration and power and people will know that the presence of God is in him that he is in her that he is using them and that he's really doing something give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight I'm telling you there may be trouble in the turn but listen he remained at the altar he stayed at the altar. I don't care what the enemy is saying. I don't care even what the church world may say. I don't care what Donald Trump is saying. I'm going to remain at the altar. I'm going to remain at the altar. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But catch this in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable always, abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You say, listen, I'm at the altar every day, Jade. Listen, I've been praying for revival and restoration, Pastor Jade. I've been seeking God for my lost loved ones and I just don't feel it anymore I don't think he's hearing me anymore listen did you not hear the text tonight he says if you will remain steadfast unmovable listen if you will go abounding and doing the work of the Lord he said your labor is not in vain you're going to see that baby come home you're going to see the blind eyes open you're going to see revival at your workplace you're going to get a phone call from someone you never knew or thought or, or whatever saying listen I need you to come over to my house I need you to pray for me I got cancer eating up my body and you're going to go and you're going to lay hands on the sick and you're going to see them recover I believe that God wants to do something in regard Regardless of what the enemy is trying to do. Stand steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. That word abounding in the Greek is the word, per, well Lord, I can't read Greek I guess. Parisio. You know what that word means? To remain. To remain. Steadfast, unmovable, always remaining in the work of the Lord. Because the enemy's number one tool that he uses is what? Distraction. In the garden, in the beginning, 
It was deception and distraction. They walked with God. But he got them distracted. Hey, look at me. I want to talk to you. I want to tell you something. And then after he got their, uh, 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 their attention, then came deception. The enemy would love to distract you from what God has planned for your life. But let me tell you, if you will stay steadfast, unmovable, always remaining or abounding in the work of the Lord, it will not be in vain. Jesus Christ has given you the victory. Listen, Samuel's focus was fixed on God. He wasn't worried about what everybody else was saying or doing. His focus was on God. Listen, we're in an age where there's prophetic voices like never before. And I praise God for that. Pastor, it's awesome. Seeing things come to pass, especially biblical prophecy come to pass. It's amazing. But we're living in a culture in the Pentecostal church. I'm just going to be honest. We're looking at all the signs. Oh, wow, did you see that happen? Did you see that happen? Yes, it's, I, they, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But Jesus said this in Luke chapter 21 and verse 25 through 28. And, these, and there shall be signs. Listen, there's signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. Listen, there's fear all over the place. And looking after those things which are coming on the earth for powers of heaven shall be shaken. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And, and he says in verse 27, And then shall they see the Son of Man come in a cloud with power and with great glory. But watch what Jesus says. He says, when, and when these things begin to come to pass, more or less what he's saying, Chris, is when you see these signs, don't look at the signs. You, you, you know the signs. Don't focus on the signs. He says, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh listen God's not coming back for a church that's looking here and looking there and looking over here and, and wanting to respond over there no he's looking for a church that is fixed on him say listen my redemption's coming my redeemer's coming Jesus is coming I know this, this, this world is going to waste away but when he comes down when he brings his kingdom down when he brings his people down when he brings heaven down everything's going to change we have a world that's driving down the road of life looking at all the signs hoping that they don't wreck looking unto Jesus is what Hebrews 12 says looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher he's already wrote the story I've read the back of the book brother Steve he wins he wins. I don't care what everyone else has to say. I, I want to know what my God says. I want to know what He says. Listen. We're, we're in a world that current events is at your fingertips. It, it's just right there. But listen, I, I'm not going to listen. I, I'm not going to look, look to the signs. I'm not going to listen to the voices. I'm going to look up. Whenever I feel overwhelmed, I'm going to go to the rock that is higher than I. I'm going to stand on the foundation which is Christ Jesus, the cornerstone that the builders rejected. Hey, when it gets bad, I'm going to dive into his word. I'm going to remain at the altar. The enemy would love nothing more for than the church to be in utter panic and forsake the altar. The only reason that America hasn't plummeted already, I believe this, is because there's been a remnant of people that would not forsake the altar. Listen, God is up to something. God is doing something. But we have to remain in the work of the Lord. 
Listen, the true, the true church in this time will remain in the altar. Remain in preaching the gospel. Remain in preaching Jesus. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8, Philip went out. And two times in that chapter, it says he just preached Jesus. Not five ways to get successful. No, Jesus. What do you got a problem with? Jesus. What are you dealing with? Jesus. He didn't say, now, 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 now listen to me. And he's talking to the eunuch from, from Ethiopia. Now listen to me, bro. Listen, if you just vote for this guy, your problems are going to be gone. No. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. We have to remain. I believe God wants to do something in the time we're living in. But for us to experience the victory that God wants to grant us, I believe we must do three things. The first one, I've been saying, we have to remain at the altar. There are three things that we have to do. First, we have to remain at the altar. All three things are bottled up in our text tonight. Remaining in the altar, unmovable, steadfast, abounding, remaining in the work of the Lord. But the second thing is we have to lift up the Lamb. We have to lift up the Lamb. The Bible says in our, in our text tonight, in verse 9, that Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy Holy. Landy, can you put the text back up there for me? Verse 9. Holy. It's not like, oh Lord, you are holy. Holy as in all. As in all. We have to lift up the Lamb. And we have to give our all to Him. John says in, in John chapter 1 and verse 29 that John the Baptist was, was baptizing on the banks of the river Jordan. And it said that John seeth Jesus coming and he saith unto him, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus said later on in the book of John, in John 12 and 32, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto... Samuel grabbed the lamb and offered it up to God. He pleaded the blood, if you will. I plead the blood of the perfect, spotless lamb. That's what it had to be according to Leviticus 22. It had to be perfect without spot or blemish to be accepted by God. So church above anything... We need to remain in the altar. And we need to lift up the name of Jesus. We need to proclaim the name of Jesus. The Lamb of God that still takes away the sins of the world. We need to proclaim the man that came, was born of a virgin, and set us free. Listen, he was lifted up on a cross to purify our sins. And when Jesus was lifted up, on that cross, we were granted access to the very throne room of God, giving us access to victory. There may be trouble in the turn, but pastor, there's victory. There's victory. The Bible tells us that He's the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb, the spotless one. And if he be lifted up, if he be lifted up, he would draw all men unto himself. He would, he would even say, listen, the world may hate you. And the enemy may come at you, but know this, that I have overcome the world. There's nothing that the enemy can do to stop a church that will remain at the altar and continually and wholly. That means all. Completely. Offer your praise and your worship to the Lamb. He continued. He remained. And he lifted up the Lamb. But the third thing we must do. Am I boring you tonight? I'm sorry. 
I believe God wants to do something by the end of this service. I really do. 1 Samuel chapter 7 and 9 says he took that suckling lamb and offered it. The third thing we must do is sacrifice. We must remain at the altar. We must lift up the lamb. Sister Mary, the Bible tells us in verse 10 of this chapter, the enemy drew, drew closer. And he never, he never, Jaden, he never turned around and acknowledged the enemy behind him or beside him or in front of him. He continued to sacrifice. When it looked as bad as it could look, he continued to sacrifice. When it got as dark as dark could be, Jaden, he just, he just I'm going to keep offering to the Lord. I'm just going to keep sacrificing. I'm just going to remain here. Uh, listen, I, I'm going to remain at this altar. I, I'm going to lift up the lamb. And I'm going to continue to sacrifice. How many times... Have we ourselves individually, I'm, let, 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 I'm not talking about the nation right now, but uh, we ourselves have faced overwhelming odds. And listen, the, un, the, the, the people of Israel were unprepared to fight a battle. And I, I, there's things that's come into my life I felt so ill-equipped for and unready for. and I, I didn't know how to handle it. And, and I, I felt overwhelmed. And I felt like the enemy was closing in and, and the world was closing in and, and my world was crashing in on me. How many has ever felt that way before? But church, if we'll do what Samuel did and continue to sacrifice... Not only offering yourself to the Lord, but even when you don't feel like it, offering a sacrifice of praise. Even when you don't feel like it, you raise your hands and you worship and you praise through the pain. And you call out to God. And you say, Jesus, I don't know what else to do, but you're still good. You're still on your throne. You're still righteous. You're still holy. You're still in control of this. God, I, I feel like it's crashing all around me. My enemies are waiting for me to fall over. The devil desires to sift me as wheat. But God, here I am. I'm going to sacrifice. And I'm going to praise your holy name. I'm going to lift you up, oh God. I'm going to remain in this place. I'm not getting my focus off you. Lord, I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. But listen, as Hebrews said, if we will offer up a sacrifice of praise to God continually, continually, that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. The psalmist said, oh magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. He also says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Continually, all times. You say, well, Pastor Jade, I'm afraid. Many people out there are afraid to do what God's calling them to do, afraid of COVID-19, afraid of the rioting, afraid of this, afraid of that. Listen, we never run out of things to be afraid of. But the psalmist said in Psalms 91 and 7, he says, listen, a thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Church, we have to stay steadfast if they'll come to the music tonight. We have to stay steadfast, unmovable, and remain in the work of the Lord. Never leave your post. Never leave your post. So we have the three things we have to remain. We're to lift up the Lamb. And 
we're to continue to sacrifice. Those aren't easy things to do. But just like in our text tonight, if we just shut everything else off, and not acknowledge everything, Listen, you can spend all day replying to everything. You know, I've had people call me, hey, why didn't you text me back? I had nothing to say. You say, oh, that's mean, Jaden. No. Well, well, Jade, we're the church, and we got to listen. The church of Jesus Christ is not a political machine. Listen, I believe in voting. I believe in participating in your government. I absolutely believe that. If I was being honest, there's one candidate that I would really like to win for the presidency. His name's not Joe. But that's my opinion, okay? But that doesn't matter. I'll get in trouble for that later, but that doesn't matter. Because the gospel is not an elephant by my name, a donkey by my name. Tea Party, Libertarian, none of that. Jesus was, was, his ministry was started in one of the most crazy political times of the ancient world. Rome was all political, 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 political. He was born into a time where they wanted a savior to be this King David and just rule and reign and get rid of Rome. And they wanted a political leader. And I'm going to be honest with you, church. I think the American church thinks a political leader is just going to turn it all around. Got news for you. You're wrong. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for our leaders. Yes. I'm not saying that God can't anoint one to use. Absolutely. But he said, listen, I put them up. I take them down. You don't worry about it. And Jesus was born into this culture where it would have been very easy, Brother Steve, for him to be political. But when they asked him, Pastor, hey, what what do you say about taxes? And I wish, this is one text in the Bible, I wish Jesus would have said not to pay taxes. But he said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But give unto God what is God's. They asked him, Pilate asked him, are you a king? Ava gets it. And he said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my, my, my servants would fight. He was saying, Pilate, you all got, we're not a political machine. I'm not here for a political movement. I'm not here to start a rebellion. Jesus didn't have a beef with Rome you want to know who Jesus had a beef with religious people that wanted to be political Pharisees and Sadducees wanted to run the show look all nice and be on TV not that I'm, listen I'm, there's good men and women of God out there on TV I, I'm not I'm not saying that But Jesus said, listen, if you become religious and political, you're perverting the purity of God's word. It's not for your gain. It's for God's gain. Amen. And Jesus said, listen, I'm not here to be political. Political. 
here to change lives. You want to end racism? It's as simple as giving your heart to Jesus. Transforming life. You want to get rid of that? Preach the kingdom. You want to preach a prosperous and great nation? Preach the kingdom. It's as simple as that. But everybody's got something to say. If you'll stand with me across this house. Everybody's got something to say. Everybody's got an opinion. And listen, it's time that we come to a place where we lose our opinions, lose our will, our plans, and go to an altar, remain there, lift up the name of Jesus, and sacrifice even when we don't feel like it. But our story doesn't end at verse 10. It actually begins at the second half of verse 10. It says, But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day. You say, well, why is that important? Because when you begin to break down the text, the first word thundered means to roar. But the second thunder in this verse is not the same word. And it means voice. Because if we will get quiet. And if we will stop listening to what everyone else has to say and go to an altar and remain there, God is saying, there's something I want to say. He's saying that He roared with a great voice. He roared with a great voice. Because listen, church, we spend so much time trying to defend ourselves. And God says, what are you doing? Let me speak. Stop trying to entice them. Let me show them. Stop spending all your time talking about revival and stay at the altar and let me show you revival. I have something to say. And he roared with a great voice. The enemy scattered. And all Samuel did was remain at the altar. All he did was lift up the name of Jesus. All he did was continue to sacrifice. He didn't acknowledge everything going on around him. It was just him and God. And he saved a nation. Because God wanted to thunder. He wanted to speak. Thunder takes clouds. Thunder takes lightning. The Bible tells us Elijah's servant said, I see a cloud. Children of Israel were led in the wilderness, a cloud by day. When Moses went up to Mount Zion, a cloud would descend. It's his presence. The thunder is his voice. Thunder always is a little delayed from the lightning because the lightning is something we see. God wants to show us something so He can say something. We have to remain. I end with this.
remain can be defined in three ways. First is to be apart, not destroyed. There's some of you, the enemy has come and he's tried to destroy your life, steal your joy, take your hope. Steal your purpose. Young people, steal your purpose. You need to hold on to that. Because that's what the enemy desires to do in a young life is to steal their purpose. Because when he steals your purpose, you run around for 30 years trying to figure out who you are. Because your purpose is tied to your identity. But listen, he can try. Sister Mary, there's something that remains. If you stay at the altar, there's something that remains. That's the first way it can be defined. Is something that is a part of something that has not been destroyed. The enemy would love to have taken you out, but he hasn't. Secondly, it means to continue unchanged. The old saints used to say, Sister Mary, my mind's made up. Samuel said, my mind's made up. I'm staying here. church that's where we need to be is where we're unchanged you can't change our minds we've seen too much we've been too far to turn around now but thirdly remain can be defined as to be something yet to be seen it remains to be seen that's how you would use that in a sentence Oh, that church over there, this is God talking. That church over there, they got something going on. But there's something that remains to be seen. There's something there that remains to be seen. The enemy has come and tried to destroy you, but you remained. The enemy has tried to take your faith, but you stand unchanged and you remained. And if you make it past the first two definitions, there's something that remains to be seen. God wants to do something in your life that even you couldn't believe. Tell TJ back there all the time, let God blow your mind. So church... Be steadfast, unmovable, remaining in the work of the Lord. Is there anyone in the house that says, I'll remain? Pastor, I'll remain. Why? My children need to be saved. My city needs deliverance. My, my, My children need to know their purpose. I'll remain. If you grab the hand of the person next to you. God, we come before you. And we thank you, Jesus, that even though that the enemy has come to steal, to kill and destroy, that you've came and you've given us life and life more abundantly, and we remain not destroyed, not deterred. Lord God, I thank you that there's something in my heart that remains unchanged. I have faith, I I believe. But God, right now, I want to give you a little extra thanks for what remains to be seen. God, I believe that the people under the sound of my voice tonight have yet but but seen a a glimmer of what you want to do in this ministry. God, that they haven't seen the full vision of what you have for their life. God, that Connorsville won't even see it coming. But Lord, you're going to thunder. 
You're going to lightning. There's going to be a cloud, Lord, and you're going to rain down on your people again. But God, I, I make a declaration with my brothers and my sisters that I'm going to remain in the altar. I'm going to lift up your name, Jesus. Lord God, I'm going to lay down my life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Lord, I believe right now that you're transforming hearts and lives. Lord, that you're changing our perspective. That no matter what the enemy may come to do, no matter what sickness may come to do, no matter what this world system wants to do, that I will remain at the altar. Lord, we spend so much time. Let us no longer waste no more energy trying to answer to everything that this world has to throw at us. Let's just say it's you and me, God. It's you and me. Oh, my soul, my Savior, my Lord and my King. I thank you that you remain faithful. Let us, Lord, remain faithful to you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, the church says amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise.